Welcome to the Interfex 2010 Main Stage, presented by Biofarm International and Pharmaceutical Technology. I'm Laura Bush, Editor-in-Chief of Biofarm International, and I'm here today with John Hyde, Founder and Chairman of Hyde Engineering and Consulting. We invited John to talk to us today about what we learned from the H1N1 pandemic. John, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, John, we all know that there were a number of problems that arose during the H1N1 pandemic response, and one of the main problems was that the strain didn't grow as well as expected. How bad was that problem, and is there something that we could do about that for future pandemics? Well, so Sanofi and Novartis both reported slow-growing strains, and um, Sanofi in particular made an adjustment that they announced in their seed stock that helped to solve that problem, but they lost valuable time in doing that. Uh, Metamune, on the other hand, had a, a reasonably fast-growing strain that they were pleased with, and they make the uh, nasally inhaled vaccine, uh, but they had problems getting enough spray bottles, oddly enough. So there were all kinds of, of production issues. Uh, certainly the, the growth of the uh, antigen was, was a main one. Uh, but what this points up is uh, it's just difficult to have a quick response to a pandemic flu like this, or at least we're showing that, that we weren't really as prepared as we could have been, uh, both in terms of the viral growth and also just basic supplies like spray bottles, for heaven's sake. So, uh, yeah, there is work to be done. Mm -hmm. And several companies also had stability problems and had to recall some lots. What happened there exactly? Well, so um, Sanofi uh, announced that they uh, eventually recalled four lots. I think this was announced in either November or December of last year. And it had to do with um, uh, stability issue. Now, the way they test this is uh, they, they take the, the vaccine and they do a potency test uh, following distribution at various points uh, in time following distribution. And, and the vaccine was found to not meet the potency criterion, even though the vaccine had been given to uh, some, some people. But uh, ultimately, almost 800,000 doses were recalled which was a substantial amount of the production. There were four lots, they were pre-filled syringes, uh, some 10-pack, some 25-pack um, uh, groups. So, you know, it's, it, 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 was, it was a problem. There was no safety issue. And in fact, uh, both CDC and Sanofi uh, felt that most people that received the vaccine probably got some uh, immune system benefit from the vaccine. It just wasn't clear that it would be enough of a dose to protect them against H1N1. I'm, uh, I mean, we can talk about this later, I think, but this, this points up the problem sometimes with vaccine administration. So is it better to use a liquid product or, or a liquid-filled product, which has some inherent stability problems? I mean, the problem is, and I don't know this for a fact about these recalls, I don't know exactly what the issue was, but in the past, vaccines have had problems, liquid problems, where the uh, antigen or, or other uh, essential components like an adjuvant actually precipitate out and so they're not available a as part of the dosage. Now some companies go with uh, lyophilization which is drying the product in a vial but that's more expensive. Also uh, there, there's a risk of contamination that you don't have with the liquid filled process so uh, th there are some issues there as well and I think that uh, this stability type of, of uh, work is not as an exact science as it could be. So I think there's a lot of work that could be done there. Mm -hmm. And I noticed there were companies that sold both adjuvanted and non-adjuvanted versions. Was there any difference in the stability there? And are there any lessons to be learned from that? Well, it, it's hard to know whether there were exact stability problems. But, um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, the, a couple of the adjuvanted formulations uh, were linked to higher rates of anaphylactic reactions. So. Um, the, the health uh, ministry of the province of British Columbia in Canada uh, actually uh, uh, announced a, a much, much higher rate of anaphylaxis for the adjuvanted products. And I think that might have um, scared potentially some people away from considering that. Uh, you know, the adjuvant is, is some other substance that's added to the antigen that gives a better immune response uh, for the amount of dosage. So this would have solved or, or potentially solved the supply problem because of the slow growth. But because of this anaphylactic uh, reaction, um, some, uh, some uh, manufacturers stayed away from it. In fact, I believe GSK uh, recalled some product because of uh, fear of reaction. Mm -hmm. 
And although borders did not close during H1N1, as many people have feared for pandemic situations, we did have some problems with uneven worldwide distribution, where some countries like ours had too much and other countries, particularly developing countries, were short on supply. Do you think this experience will change our thinking about where vaccine manufacturing facilities should be located or about how government or you know WHO contracts are set up? Yeah, so I, I think this is very interesting. Um, there are uh, companies that, uh, that we know of that are looking at uh, what I would call uh, very, very highly uh, developed small-scale manufacturing facilities to deal with vaccination basically on the ground wherever the problem is. And uh, in particular, there's a company called Afrovax, uh, and they've reported, and this is egg technology, this isn't cell culture, they've reported a new technology for growing um, uh, virus in eggs that, that produces 100 doses per egg. The traditional process produces one dose per egg, so you can imagine the reduction in cost. Uh, if you couple that with uh, the possibility of single-use components, uh, so now you can have a facility that has a small footprint because the single-use components can take up less footprint, a more flexible facility, so it doesn't need to be designed for a specific vaccine product, which is what we do now. I mean, most vaccine producers build a plant to make uh, one product. And, and so these would be plants that would make multiple products. And, uh, and yes, they could basically be parachuted in, if you will. It's kind of a prefab concept uh, and, and populated with the components required to make any given vaccine product in the localized area. So yes, people, people and governments in particular, some African governments are looking for um, uh, funding to, to go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Several firms have started manufacturing flu vaccines, both seasonal and pandemic, in cell culture. Are we now on the fast track to phasing out egg-based production? Well, uh, um, what does, uh, I, I can't remember the sportscaster that, that always says this on ESPN, but not so fast, right? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think cell culture tech, uh, technology is very, very attractive. And why is it attractive? Well, certainly reduced cost of production. So. Um, Sanofi uh, reports uh, how many eggs they go through on a regular basis for flu vaccine, and I mean it's hundreds of millions. Well, it's one per dose. So however many doses they make, that's how many eggs they go through. Imagine the cost of production, and these aren't just you know eggs from the grocery store. These are from specific chickens, and it's a specific strain, and it has to be a fertilized egg, and I mean all of these complications, right? So if you think, well, instead, I'm just gonna grow this culture in a, in a big tank, and I'm gonna make the, uh, the antigen that way, that, that's very, very attractive. And also quick changeover, right? Because it's the same process system, basically for any number of different uh, cell culture-based vaccines. So very, very uh, interesting. However, there have been a lot of problems with process development and scale up from lab scale to pilot scale to production scale. And uh, those, those problems haven't been worked out yet. So, I think as the cell culture models become more scalable and more robust, they absolutely will replace a substantial amount of the egg technology. But uh, there's a lot more upfront work that has to go into this cell culture model. And maybe for a quick response, we still stay with eggs because it's a proven technology. So I, I'm not sure eggs are ever gonna completely go away, but I think cell culture is a, is a good way to get rid of at least some of the egg-based production. Interesting. So you alluded before to single-use technologies and methods to produce vaccines locally and, and quickly. And I know there are a number of companies working on methods for doing yes. that and from a variety of angles. Sort of overall, what's the state of those efforts? Well, I, I think, again, um, one of the real driving forces here is single-use technology. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, a, a, an average biopharma or, or biologics vaccine type facility might take anywhere from three and a half years from groundbreaking to five years to go from groundbreaking to GMP production. That's a long timeline. And, uh, and there's a plant, uh, a vaccine plant that was built in South San Francisco five years ago based almost primarily on single use technology that was groundbreaking to GMP production in 13 months. So worst case, almost a reduction of a five-fold reduction in timeline. Uh, so very, very uh, interesting, right? And not only is it interesting from the point of view of low capital cost, but it's also interesting from the point of view of if you do, in fact, capture those four years, think of all of the revenue that you lose by going with the traditional uh, you know, tanks and pipes and, and stainless steel approach. 
Now, there must be higher operating costs for the disposables, right? Because you, you, you buy a, a disposable fermenter, you, you use it once, and you throw it away. But again, not so fast. If you, when, once you count all of the costs there, the cost difference is not as great as it seems because you never have to clean uh, a disposable. Uh, so you don't, have to, you don't have to develop a cleaning cycle. You don't have to validate the cleaning cycle. You never have to sterilize that bag or, or that tubing or whatever. So, and, and you don't have to requalify those activities. And you don't have to requalify the equipment that you do those activities in. So there's a lot of saving both in effort and in um, utilities. So you don't have the clean steam use, the water use, and so on. Right, so by the time you count all those things in, the differences between uh, single-use based manufacturing and uh, permanent equipment based manufacturing may not be that great. Right. You know, and I know that uh, a few years ago, BARDA, the U.S. government's Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, initiated its AMP program, or Accelerated Manufacture of Pharmaceuticals to foster the development of rapid response manufacturing. What kind of progress has been made through that initiative? Well, I, I'm not really that familiar with BARDA in terms of um, their mission necessarily, but I have watched them, I guess, as we all have, in terms of you know who they give money to, basically. And I know recently they awarded a $143 million contract to Eleusis to make an inhaled anthrax vaccine. I think that's probably for use by the military. I'm not sure, but I think it is. Um, so. My uh, understanding of what they do is primarily fund um, research and products that they want made for specific government use. I would like to see someone, BARDA or someone like BARDA, uh, maybe take more of an interest in funding manufacturing technology. So in other words, instead of buying a specific product, maybe funding you know, the uh, development of the pandemic uh, flu facility you know, of the future, whatever that is. So maybe it's, again, more research into single-use technology. Uh, something that, that we don't use really very extensively at all in the pharmaceutical business, including vaccine manufacturing, is uh, statistical process control. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see um, companies take a lead in that. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny to see all these companies that talk about their Six Sigma uh, people and all the black belts that they have running around and so on. But then when, when you get down to the end, you find out that they really don't use statistics to analyze, monitor, or improve their manufacturing process. So what is the value of the Six Sigma? It's, it's not of much value unless you really start measuring things, collecting that data, and analyzing that data statistically to make improvements in the process. I mean, we, we use um, really uh, much more advanced manufacturing technology in this country to make toys and potato chips and, and juice boxes than we do to make uh, pharmaceutical products. And I, I think there's really something wrong with that picture. The driving force, unfortunately, is margin. So there's much, much, le much less margin in toys and potato chips and juice boxes than there is in, in a pharmaceutical product. So the economic driver is not there, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. So in summary then, what would be your sort of bottom line response to the question of what, what are the key lessons that we learned from H1N1? Well, I, I mean, uh, this is, probably almost too obvious to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I mean, I mean the, the primary lesson is we really need to have a better preparation for a pandemic outbreak. We need manufacturing processes that are more robust and that are more flexible and that are quicker time to market. And right now, again, the industry appears to be focused on one product, one plant. I think we need to look at one class of products, one plant. And, and we aren't there yet. Uh, the other thing is, um, I think that there still could be a lot of, uh, of good work done on no specific product, but maybe say on a, on a class of vaccines in terms of best delivery system. What's, what's the cheapest delivery system? So this, this nasally inhaled uh, a vaccine product is, is very interesting as compared to a subcutaneously injected product. Um, if you throw lyophilization in, again, you've got a whole other level of complexity, but you may need, or people feel that they may need to do that for stability. So what about research into maybe new um, uh, excipients that we can add to liquid products to keep these particles in suspension? I mean, I, you know, there's a very, very limited list of things that people use, and I think there's a fear uh, on the manufacturer's part that if they go out and stick their neck out and use something that's maybe new or whatever, that that's going to open up a whole other can of worms. But let's face it, the 800,000 dose recall must have been painful for Sanofi. 
Um, and they did their very best. I mean, that product tested perfectly uh, when it was released, and then there was some stability issue that they really had not predicted and had no control over. Wouldn't it be great if we could make that go away, those kinds of problems? So I, I think those are the main lessons learned, and, and, and I think it would be great to see the industry and maybe an industry government partnership to really develop manufacturing platforms for vaccine products that aren't specific to any given product. Excellent point. Well, John, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate your having me. I've been talking to John Hyde, founder and chairman of Hyde Engineering and Consulting, live at Interfex 2010 in New York. You can see more vidcasts from Interfex and other events at biofarminternational.com slash interfex2010. This is Laura Bush, editor-in-chief of Biofarm International. Thanks so much for watching.